It's the World This Week, the World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Joining us from London, Patrick Smith, Editor-in-Chief of The Africa Reports. How are things by the banks of the Thames? The, uh, the banks of the Thames are unseasonably cold. Um, uh, apart from that, we've just been rocked by the news that the uh, number two in the government, uh, Dominic Raab, has resigned after bullying allegations. So uh, this is the one who went on, on vacation, here. right, um, when he was insular. foreign secretary. Uh, that's right. Yeah, in the middle of the Afghan um, crisis, in fact. Yeah, he was on a beach. Um, felt there was no reason to hurry back. <laughs> so he's got a bit of form on this. All right, Patrick Smith. <laughs> Thanks. We also want to welcome back uh, Richard Verli, France correspondent, columnist for the uh, Swiss News website. Uh, Blick. Good evening, Francois. H how are things with you? Well, so far, so good. You know, Switzerland is a peaceful country, so we're quiet at that point. All right. Calmness and communication strategist Philippe Morochevrolet brings a half century of wisdom and experience to yes, us. Yes, exactly. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank oh. you. So, All right. It's a nice age. And from New York City, Noor Ibrahim, international news editor for The Daily Beast. H how are things in Gotham? Nice and warm. Nice and warm. <laughs> really nice out here. Lucky, lucky you. You can listen, like, and subscribe to The World This Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. Eid Mubarak, Sudan and much of the Muslim world marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan, three days of feasting, but there's no celebrating in Khartoum. This has been the soundtrack this Friday and for the last seven days after nearly a week of urban warfare, a showdown between the Junta leader and his nominal number two, who heads the paramilitary RSF militias. There were hopes of a ceasefire for the Feast of Eid, one that could salvage a bid uh, to transfer to civilian rules four years after people power ousted longtime strongman Omar al-Bashir. For now, though, it's a pipe dream. Every minute there's a casualty, power is cut, there's looting, robberies, all of this is happening. The country is in a state of extreme chaos. As we speak, Patrick Smith, there's a fresh promise of a ceasefire, this one coming uh, from uh, Sudan's military, according to the Reuters news agency. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Sudanese will believe it when they see it. Uh, that's absolutely right. This is the, uh, the third uh, promised ceasefire this week since fighting started last Saturday. Um, and over 400 people have already been killed within the city and probably many hundreds more beyond the city and thousands have been wounded. So uh, this morning, uh, the, the ceasefire was meant to start for the Edil Fitri um, uh, end, ending of, of Ramadan, um, and initially the uh, the militia, the rapid support forces under under General Hemeti, uh, said they would keep to the ceasefire, but they didn't even do that. There had been no comment from the the National Army, the Sudan Armed Forces under General Burhan. So it's a bre <laughs> it's a move, a positive move of sorts that uh, Burhan has at this stage said they will join the ceasefire two day, uh, one day into it. But as you say, no one is holding their breath uh, in, in Khartoum or anywhere else. And just to be clear, um, and, just to be and, clear, Patrick, a, this, mm. this, this is simply a case of this town's not big enough for the two of us? Uh, well, it's, uh, this country is not big enough for the two of us either, I think. The, um, this is the first time in, in the long troubled history of militias and national army conflicts in uh, Sudan where the fighting has actually moved into Khartoum, the capital, where the 8 million people live. Uh, so uh, it, it's turned into two things, essentially. It's a battle for the control of Khartoum and all the symbolism, the TV stations, the radio, the presidential palace, the airport and everything else but also uh, less reported by us, uh, by us journalists because it's harder to get there. Much it was harder to get anywhere at the moment, but it's particularly hard to get to the hinterland. There's a war going on in Darfur, uh, Blue Nile, Nuba, and all the, the rest of uh, the, the big towns and areas 
in the country. So it's, it's a war on two levels. But essentially, it's focusing on Khartoum at the moment. And the National Army think they have the upper hand. So that might account for why they're prepared to, uh, to offer a ceasefire now. They think they've, uh, they, they've got the uh, RSF and Hameti on the run. And we've got the Rhodey News Agency reporting as we speak that heavy gunfire continues uh, in, in Khartoum. So, so much for now for that ceasefire. Just a reminder for our viewers, it was a peaceful revolution in 2019 uh, that ousted Omar al-Bashir. But the military never went away. Instead, Buran, the head of the army, uh, rolled with the punches, <laughs> staging a second coup in 2021 to keep those civilians at bay, while Hameti, his rival, the head of the dreaded Janjaweed militia reinvented himself, sent mercenaries to Yemen and Libya to curry favor uh, with uh, foreign backers and make some money. Uh, it's always tricky, Noor Ibrahim. You want revolutions to be nonviolent, uh, but at the same time, how do you handle uh, when the military never goes away? A question I guess Egyptians also must be asking themselves after 2012 over there. Absolutely. And I, and I think the fear right now is wondering whether this is going to turn into the next Syria. I think um, the general consensus is that somehow, some way, um, other actors are going to try to weasel the, their way into this. Um, so, yeah, that triggers a lot of alarm. Um, this is going to turn into another proxy war. You know, obviously, Sudan is um, a very agriculturally rich country. And uh, there's just been a lot of uh, talk just because there's so many um, international actors and countries that, that have legitimate interest there. And they might be going into this uh, with not the best intention. So uh, I think that those fears are amplified by the fact that um, neither side appears to be uh, willing to back down. And at the end of the day, it's, it's civilians that are probably going to bear the brunt of that. Richard Verli. Well, um, there is a country that we, you named, but we didn't name in the case of this conflict. It is Egypt. Egypt is clearly backing the regular army of Sudan at the moment. And I think what's going on in Egypt is followed closely by uh, uh, Marshal Sisi in power in Cairo. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I spoke preparing this program. I spoke with uh, some friends from the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they have a lot of difficulty to access the ground to rescue wounded people to eventually cater for prisoners of war. So it's really a mess. And we, we don't see it because we're very far away. But I believe it's a very bloody. And when we talk about 400 dead, I believe the figure is probably much higher than that. Yeah, difficult to count. Uh, a regional spillover uh, never far, what with armed conflict in five of the seven countries that surround Sudan and various militias inside and across the border who are always looking for some outside backing. Uh, there have been refugees uh, spilling over uh, into Chad from Darfur. Uh, Egyptian soldiers uh, were detained by the RSF before they were uh, handed over to the uh, uh, local uh, committee of the Red Cross, the Red Crescent in Sudan. And a Wall Street Journal report Thursday that's been since denied by Libya's warlord in the east, Halifa Haftar, uh, writes that he supplied ammunition to Hamedi. Uh, the previous day, as Cairo uh, was working to evacuate its troops present in Sudan, the country's president, who Richard Farli just mentioned, uh, and who, by the way, happened to attend the same officer's training school as uh, General Buran, denied that he was choosing sides. What I confirm to you, which you already know, but I am confirming it again to you and to anyone else who has doubts. No, our troops are there to conduct exercises with our brothers in Sudan and not to support any one party over the other. Patrick Smith, your, your, your reaction to that? Um, I think it's uh, another piece of fiction. Um, it's quite clear that uh, Egypt has absolutely no interest in um, Hameti taking over. So it will support Bohan, and as, as you say in your report, uh, Bohan and El Sisi attended the same Cairo Military Academy together. They have kept in close contact over the years. And El Sisi, like successive uh, leaders of Egypt, regard uh, Sudan as a kind of um, some sort of vassal state to the south. 
uh, and a, a state that, uh, <laughs> a, a, as was pointed out by Noor, it has tremendously uh, rich agricultural resources, which the Egyptian government also has its eyes on. So there's no question about it. Um, El Sisi's preference would be um, for Burhan to, to win this fight. And the, the sense most people are getting, uh, diplomats and the rest of them, uh, is that Egypt is doing its best behind the scenes to make sure he does. And should the, the Burhan be at risk of, of losing, then Egypt is likely to pile in uh, behind him. And I, I think that, 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 that is really the pa reality. Patrick, very briefly before we move on, uh, what about uh, Russia's role, because a lot has been uh, reported on the fact that uh, you have the Wagner Group, uh, which is present in Sudan, uh, 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 coveting gold mine uh, there uh, and working with the RSF. But uh, is that overblown or, or are they a big player? I think that, that, that Wagner has become this sort of journalistic obsession. Of course, it's, you know, it's important. It's important in Ukraine, terribly important in Ukraine. It's you know, important in Centrafrique. It's important in Mali uh, and increasingly in Sudan. Um, what role uh, there, there has been in this particular conflict is really hard to determine, although there, there, we have seen reports from uh, journalists in the region that, that Prigozhin uh, and Hermeti have been in contact, uh, and there are certainly Wagner personnel in the country and are said to have been training our RSF fighters. Um, a lot of the gold that, uh, from the mines that Hermeti <laughs> controls in, uh, in the west of the country, a lot of that gold ends up either mediated through uh, Russian com companies or goes straight to Dubai. And, of course, the other, the other big power in the Sudanese conflict is the United Arab Emirates, which is also backing Hameti. So it's a very complex picture with Egypt backing one side and the United Arab Emirates with all its resources and cash uh, backing the other. So um, the danger is that this is just going to rumble on uh, and um, without, without let up. And uh, that's, that's going to be a real horror for the people of Sudan. Russia's interest always perked uh, when there's gold uh, and when there's a chance to uh, shore up the quote, global south against uh, the west, uh, returning home from China just before the Russian foreign minister touched down. Brazil's president, uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, the pair talked up uh, fertilizer exports for Brazil's soy, car soy crop. They talked about beef exports to Russia. Lula at no point uh, calling uh, Russia's, uh, uh, calling out uh, Russia's I invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, Philippe Morochevolet, uh, yep. the, the, the optics of that, that uh, tour of Latin America kicking off in Brazil, whose president, by the way, is coming here to uh, Portugal and Spain now. Yeah, the Lavrov for, uh, is, is really the, um, the, the best ambassador for Putin. He's the one that can go to these uh, places and kind of deliver uh, a speech that is not really convincing, but not really not convincing. It's between the two, and uh, he's used to be doing that. Uh, he's, uh, he's doing his best efforts in order to introduce Russia back again in the international game. Is it working? Uh, yes, it's working um, when there is an economic interest that is shared by Russia and his partners, it's working. It's, uh, it's uh, presentable. Uh, it's not like Putin. It's not as, you know, people don't really know Lavrov. He's not really, uh, he doesn't appear to be that bad. He is kind of a old diplomat and uh, he's lying bluntly, uh, but he's not violent in doing that. He's acceptable in, you know. <laughs> well, let's take a listen. For Lavrov, it was uh, after Brazil, it was on to Venezuela, Nicaragua and Havana, where he landed the same day that uh, Cuba's parliament rubber stamped the re-election of communist president Miguel Diaz-Canel to another five-year term. Multipolarity is an imperative and an objective historical process that cannot be stopped. But the collective West, rallying under the umbrella of so-called American exceptionalism, is trying to do so. Why are you shaking your head, Richard Verli? Well, don't forget that this is a very fertile ground for anti-Americanism. 
in, in South America, in Cuba, in Venezuela. That's the card Lavrov is playing. He's rallying all those leaders against the Yankees, basically. And I don't think Lula is a naive uh, head of state. He knows perfectly that Putin is a dictator. He knows perfectly what he has done is Ukraine cannot be accepted. But states have no compassion. States have only interest. And the interest of Brazil at the moment is to have exports, and he can continue to export to Russia. And why not? taking advantage of a busy US at the moment. So I see it as a diplomatic game. It's very cynical, but we should understand Lula. And again, I don't think he has any personal illusion on who Putin is. And Noor Ibrahim, when it comes to Lula, he's uh, already his entourage saying he won't be saying any anti uh, uh, Ukraine stuff when he travels to Portugal and Spain. Yeah, I think that was a bit of the, the plot twist there and why the relationship between uh, Brazil and Russia is getting quite a lot of attention. Um, it's expected that, you know, the Russians are very desperate for any kind of support right now, um, but their options are limited uh, to a lot of, you know, pariah, straight, uh, pariah states. So um, it makes sense that they'd be trying to build up those relations with countries like Cuba and Venezuela. But uh, when it comes to Brazil, uh, I think there's a reason why um, that got a lot of attention from the U.S., just, you know, the fact that uh, the foreign minister emphasized just how, just how important Russia is to Brazil. Um, and even Lula going out and, and, and saying, oh, the West is actually uh, prolonging this war by arming Ukraine and kind of parroting a lot of uh, Russian propaganda there. So I think when it comes to certain um, certain nations, certain states, uh, it raises way more, you know, alarm bells than, than it would with other countries like Cuba, where you would kind of expect um, that kind of rhetoric to take over. Um, I think it's unclear right now if this is going to lead to anything substantial or, or, or very helpful, uh, but they are obviously making a very concerted effort. Um, so it's definitely something to watch, and, and I guess we'll see how it shapes up. All right. Well, the Russian foreign minister was in Cuba. Colombia's first ever left wing president was in Washington. Gustavo Petro, welcome to the White House, where he and Joe Biden kept under wraps divergences on how to handle Venezuela, how to tackle Colombia's soaring cocaine production. Afterwards, reporters again tried to draw Petro on this issue of the war in Ukraine. Previous governments bought Russian weapons long ago, helicopters mainly. The position on these weapons today and the power of the Colombian state is that they are not going to war, nor are they going to Russia, nor are they going to Ukraine. Patrick Smith, your, your thoughts on the, the sort of the, the, the dueling diplomacy there. On the one hand, Lavrov's uh, tour of uh, like-minded uh, fellow travelers in, in Latin America. And on the other, uh, Gustavo Petro, who's also a left winger, welcomed to the White House. Right. Right. I mean, well, uh, as Lula was congratulated, of course, by Joe Biden when he, you know, when he, when he won, um, you've got to remember the, the, the numerical importance of Brazil. It's, it, it accounts for half the population of Latin America. Um, and Lula's uh, trajectory from the, the leftist leader of uh, two decades ago almost uh, to a more sort of centrist leader um, has been accompanied by in increasing pragmatism. And um, as was said, you know, uh, he wants to strengthen the Brazilian economy, which was in poor shape after Bolsonaro and Dilma, uh, his, his own successor. Uh, he also wants to, to get Brazil's interests on the, the climate issue as well on the agenda and to be a leader, and that's probably his, his best card. <laughs> I think people feel that by be, uh, becoming or stating a very neutral position on, uh, on the Russia-Ukraine war and offering himself as a peacemaker, that's probably a bridge too far. But it, it does sort of shore up his, uh, his position uh, in, in the developing world. And if you add up all these places that Lavrov has been to uh, and the results of, of, of this trip to Latin America, he's got uh, three authoritarian states on, on his side and, and along with Brazil, 
Brazil uh, refusing or not, not, not openly condemning the invasion of, uh, of, of Ukraine by, by Russia, I guess you could say that this is some sort of victory for, for Lavrov. I mean, from, with a terrible hand, uh, he's certainly uh, notching up the air miles and notching up the votes uh, in subsequent debates in the UN General Assembly. So um, I, I think you know, that, that was the strategy behind it. Uh, on Monday, he's going to go to, uh, go to New York to, to, to meet with Guterres to discuss uh, the future of the grain deal. So he's, he's, as foreign minister of Russia, he's managed to, to keep the country's agenda on the international stage, uh, despite the, the, the majority horror at what Russia is doing in Ukraine. All right. And uh, it, it, speaking of competing narratives, it was the week where an 11th hour settlement spared Fox News the blushes of a defamation lawsuit over the false claim across uh, I its channels that uh, electronic vote counting machine maker Dominion rigged the election for Joe Biden in 2020. Dominion's case backed by leaked emails and texts where Fox producers and talent clearly put ratings above the truth. The plaintiff claims uh, that it's a, quote, victory for accountability. The truth matters. Lies have consequences. Over two years ago, a torrent of lies swept Dominion and election officials across America into an alternative universe of conspiracy theories causing grievous harm to Dominion and the country. Uh, Noor Ibrahim, uh, they've gotten uh, in the settlement $787.5 <coughs> million. Uh, it's not the $1.6 billion they were asking for. Uh, still, does this, uh, uh, is this a case of... Uh, uh, as that lawyer says, uh, 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 of, of, of vindication and accountability? Look, a lot of Americans don't think so, and I totally understand where they're coming from in terms of wanting to see this play out, on, uh, play out in court, uh, wanting to see all the, the skeletons uh, come out of the closet, um, especially especially after, you know, just the discovery process and the, the pretty damning um, text messages and, and conversations that were exposed there from uh, some of Fox News' top stars, uh, showing exactly what they think about uh, their own coverage, uh, their real thoughts on, on Donald Trump. So I think after seeing that, um, there was the people just want more, and, and they wanted to just see how, how deep this actually Runs uh, with the hope maybe that um, if a, if a, if the trial did play out and more did come out, then you know maybe even some loyal Fox uh, news viewers would turn away from the channel. Um, but here's the thing: I don't think that would ever happen. I think that uh, I, I get wanting to see that. I get the accountability aspect. I understand why there was a big um, reaction about that. But uh, for a lot of um, the viewers, unfortunately, what I personally think would have happened was um, they would try to either ignore it or maybe even uh, just rationalize it in a way that uh, fits with their own uh, worldviews. So, yeah, I think. So you're, you're in effect, it's, you're, you're you know, it's, it's, it's a big amount of money. You're disagreeing with uh, uh, the Daily Beast uh, columnist uh, <laughs> Wajahat Ali. <laughs> Uh, he uh, wrote a column where he said that it's America's loss that this didn't go to trial. What you're in effect saying is the, the, the media equivalent of if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, does it make any noise? Exactly. You know, I, I, I get the sentiment behind wanting that. Uh, where I disagree is that would it lead to any tangible change um, uh, or relationship with Fox News' is most loyal uh, viewers. Um, I think they would want to, you know, believe whatever they want to believe at the end of the day. And unfortunately, uh, I think if the trial did play out, it would lead to even more conspiracy theories about Donald Trump and the election um, and just spiral on because we've been in this cycle for, for a while now. And um, I think it would continue to play out that way. 
Of course, um, it, yeah, but the, so I, I'm not saying it shouldn't have gone forward. I just think uh, I don't think it would hurt Fox uh, as much as some people seem to believe it would. Philippe Moreau Chevrolet. Yes. Fox News is, is, of course, it's not a public service. No, no, it it's, certainly isn't. It's a private company. Yep. And so that means it wants to make money. Yeah, but, uh, at, first Does, Fox, at first Fox News was not for Trump. It was very much against Trump. They did try to go against him for a while. They did, it didn't succeed. So they rallied uh, Fox, the Fox News, did rally Trump, uh, because um, mostly the viewers wanted to see Trump all the time, and they loved Trump, and they still love Trump. I don't think it should have gone to trial. I think it's not important. But the important thing is we are fighting against fake news. They have to pay money. They have to... And there are more trials to some to point. Come. Yeah, there are more trials to come. There have been trials in the past. People have been sentenced to huge sums of money. So we have like antibodies, antibodies that are fighting against fake news. It's slow. Democracies are very slow. They are clumsy. They don't really know how to do it. But little by little, we do it. And we do it in France. We, you know, we just ban Russia today. We should have done it much, much earlier. But we did do it. And that's good. Uh, but these, what, you're, what Philippe is describing is public regulators doing it. Here, what we're describing is a civil lawsuit. So th there is no admission of guilt even on the part of Fox. They didn't have to go on, on air and admit to any wrongdoing. Well, to me, that's part of the problem. Um, I believe a trial would probably have uh, given more opportunity to show the extent of lies that were broadcasted by Fox News. So, though, when you have such a settlement, when, you, when you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, it means clearly that Fox is guilty. Now, shame on Fox News, because one thing that I did not follow, I may be wrong and Noor maybe will correct me, but I did not hear or see any resignation at the top of the channel of the, of the, at the moment. I did not see host resigning. I did not see journalists of Fox News coming out, apologizing. So what are these people doing? I mean, they lied, obviously, and they are still on air. <laughs> so my question is, can they remain on air without any problem? That is, to me, the thing that we should talk about. And if you think Rupert Murdoch, the boss, uh, is slowing down at age 92, Watch this exchange when a BBC reporter in New York tries to ask the media mogul about issues with British regulator Ofcom. Worried about Ofcom at all? No. Hello. You should be worried about BBC as well. You should worry about the BBC, he says, Patrick Smith. Ah, we don't, we don't have Patrick there uh, for the moment. But yeah, uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, he's a, a newspaper man f at first, and then, uh, it, you know... The he was opposed to Trump at first. He did try to fight against Trump. Uh -huh. He didn't win that fight, which is interesting, because Trump was too big for... Uh, the problem is with this kind of guys like Trump, they can lie all the time. It always appears to be kind of genuine, because they do lie genuinely. It's difficult to understand. But since they are, you know larger than life. But you just heard Richard Ferli talk about the unaccountability of these media moguls, and you hear a combative uh, No, they are not unaccountable. There. We have to fight. That's a fight. All right. We have to fight, and there is a fight going on, and we need, to, we need to reinforce that fight. We need public regulators to be much tougher than they are. And if, for instance, in France, we have in public, uh, on the television, on, pub, on the public service of television, we have two, three people that are currently uh, heading TV shows that are fighting against disinformation. These guys are left basically alone, facing on Twitter huge crowds of people f uh, harassing them. We should help them. We should reinforce that antibodies to fight against that disinformation wave. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I believe after such a settlement, Fox News management will probably be more cautious during the incoming presidential election in the U.S. So it may be good news for Biden. I believe that the management, but also the journalists, even if they don't resign, they will not be able to behave as they did nor in the is it, Nor Ibrahim, is this that, what your crystal ball tells you? No, I would be absolutely floored if that happened. That's all I have to say. Absolutely floored. I think, I don't think that, that <laughs> I don't think it will change uh, one iota of how maybe maybe in terms of um, in terms of the actual election, in terms of um, the way they 
the way Tuck, someone like Tucker Carlson uh, presents his things, definitely not. Uh, they might be a little more cautious when uh, discussing, is like, uh, <coughs> discussing issues that involve companies like Dominion that, uh, that have, you know, the power to fight back and, and the money to really screw them over if they wanted to. Do I think it will minimize the amount of lies that are broadcast um, every day? No, not at all, because that is what makes Fox money in the first place. That's what viewers tune in to, to watch. Um, and, and without that, you know, uh, they really have nothing. So I would be completely shocked if, if that was the case. Yeah, you mentioned Tucker Carlson there, who's got the highest rating cable TV news show uh, in, in the United States, and, and Fox uh, uh, often beats uh, all of its rivals, big rivals, uh, combined in the ratings uh, stakes uh, uh, nightly. Philippe Morochevrolet, there's a French captain uh, of industry who's pushing opinion-driven uh, yep. cable news. We have our own little uh, Fox He's news. got a little Fox. He's got yeah. less money. <laughs> He's got, it's on a lower scale. You wrote a graphic novel yes. uh, before last year's election where you imagine his name is Vincent Bolloré pushing his biggest ratings getter, uh, he's a presenter of a show that's more directed towards young people, uh, Cyril Hanouna, uh, as a candidate for president. Uh, the, the Vincent Bolloré, uh, does he loom in the same way that a Rupert Murdoch can on U.S. politics? He's not on the same scale. He's not all about media, like Murdoch, obviously. Uh, he's becoming a, a media mogul. He's not reached the peak of his power, so it's difficult to know whether, whether he will really be uh, trying to be all-powerful, all-influential or not. He's, he's taking this road, obviously. Does it work, doing opinion-driven uh, not cable not, TV news? It's not working to the scale that it works in the U.S. We don't have that many viewers that are interested into that kind of things. Uh, it's not as blocked as it is in the U.S. I will give you an example. Uh, in the U.S., you can have Dos Santos. You, you remember Dos Santos, this congressman that lies all the time. He lied George about, Santos. Uh, George Santos, sorry. Uh, the, George Santos did something very uh, uh, that you couldn't do in France. He, he, he told the Republicans that he was pro-Trump pro-guns and, you know, anti-abortion. And on, in the same time, in the meantime, he was telling to the Democrats that he was a former cancer victim, uh, son of uh, people that survived the Holocaust and other many other lies. And these two bubbles could coexist perfectly well because you've got the different medias, different bubbles, and it's very fixed. In France, it's not done yet. We're in the process of doing that. I hope we will avoid that. Uh, it, would be, it wouldn't be possible still at the moment. So Bolloré is trying very hard to build f f local Fox News, but the culture is not there yet. I hope it won't be ever. And so he has a cultural fight that is not really won, for the moment at least. I'm trying to be optimistic. Uh, clearly there are at the moment comparisons made between Bolloré and Murdoch, but they are two very different type of persons. Murdoch made his fortune, his career, his money out of news. He was always in the news business and in the fake news business. While Bolloré is... Well, not just. I mean, he owns respectable publications like the Times that's of London, true. like that's the Wall true. Street but Journal. He made a lot of, that's true. But he made a lot of money out of Fox News and so on when he invested on TV. While Bolloré is a newcomer on TV. He's a newcomer. He's been there for 10 years or so. So I believe he, he cannot reach anyway the level of Murdoch. Plus, we have something in continental Europe that yes, we should keep in mind. It's the European Commission and the European Commission has very strict regulation on competition and against concentration. So I believe at the moment it won't be able for Bolloré, it won't be possible to reach that level of strength, <coughs> of media strength that Murdoch has acquired. All right, now it's time for a segment we could call Emmanuel Macron's Splendid Isolation. In last week's episode, the French president's unpopular pension reform had just been validated. It was since enacted in a hurry before he took to primetime television, where 15 million viewers tuned in to hear Macron acknowledge Monday evening the anger of the street before insisting that it was all for the best and unrolling the laundry list of reforms he wants to tackle next in the four years that remains before his second and term limited final term ends. But detractors are not ready to move on. 
Yes, the same pat, pots and pans protests launched during his Monday speech uh, in various parts of France, dogging him Wednesday on an outing to the eastern Alsace region, and this one, uh, another to the southern Hérault region on Thursday. Macron claiming that he's unfazed. But if it's just with eggs and pans, these are for cooking. Are those the right words to be using, Philippe Morochevole? And phased. No, when, when you, hear, you hear there uh, in that clip saying uh, that, uh, what, pots, are, pots and pans are for cooking and, and, and... Oh, yeah, he's been telling that. Yes, he's trying to, you know, he's very much into provoking the other side to get even more angry. So it could be, at some point, uh, the calm, calmer person in the room, and he loves to be doing that. Well, his strategy is the same that of the, the Yellow Vest movement is spreading some money around to some categories that need to be tended for, like the teachers, for instance, that's what he did this week. Then he also uh, tries to appear that, you know, very calm, meeting people uh, like he likes to do, one-to-one, uh, -one, and uh, he tries to embark everyone into this new news uh, trip and away from the shores of the pension reform debate. He's very, trying very hard to do that. It doesn't succeed so far because people are so angry and, you know, there is there is social economic problem, but there is no a more problematic democratic problem because he enforces law in the parliament without any vote with 80 percent of the well, population. Well, it was turned into a vote of confidence. Uh, yeah, but that's he not the same it thing. Through. That's not the same thing at all. Right. Not at all. Uh, in the, he wants us to forget that uh, we didn't have any control over that legislation whatsoever. No, that's the first time in our history that a law is being passed through the parliament without any kind of vote. No vote. That's the first time. And so that's really the, the real problem is that we don't, we start to wonder whether we really know that guy. And that's not a good question to ask after six years in the mandate. Is, he's, his um, popularity has dropped to 26%. That's dangerously close to the numbers that François Hollande, his predecessor, <laughs> had. Uh, Richard Verly, uh, picking up on what Philippe just said, is this the same Emmanuel Macron that you knew? Uh, I completely agree. He's trying to play ago? the same strategy that he did with the yellow vest. He's trying to repeat that, but he's got two main problems, and these problems won't disappear. First problem, we're talking about pans and noise. Macron's political kitchen is empty. That's hey, what you, I wrote. You wrote, you wrote uh, a piece this week uh, by, uh, that uh, uh, said that um, pots and pans are the sounding board of a France where the art of making meals together is disappearing. Macron is the president of the generation that get its, gets its food delivered. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So friends, friends' political kitchen is empty. What can he get out of his closet in the kitchen? What can he serve to French people at the moment? Yesterday, there was a press conference by Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire, who said very clearly that because of the level, level of public debt, France is now very exposed to a rise of interest rates. And he said, we have to be very, very careful. So there is no money left. Even if he, want, even if he wants to spread some money, and he's trying to, that's... The amount will be limited because he spent 240 billion during the, the pandemic as the quoi qu'il en coûte, whatever it <coughs> takes. So I think Macron is the back against the wall. He's trying again to move to another political sequence and he's banking on the fatigue. He, he believes that French people with summer coming and so on will get tired of mobilization. So what we have to watch is Labor Day, 1st of May. That's the moment trade unions have called for a big rally. We'll see French people go in the streets again. And you were saying before we went on air, in your native Switzerland, he still has a well, good he's still, street he's rep. Well, he still has, I believe, good international rating, not only in Switzerland. Uh, throughout Europe, I was in Berlin recently, I was in London. He's still viewed as a president who wants to reform France and who doesn't manage to succeed, who doesn't succeed in reforming this country. So he still has quite a positive image. The difficulty for him now is he's not able to deliver. And France's neighbor were expecting him to deliver. If he cannot deliver, he's going to lose its international credibility. Nor Ibrahim, uh, I know he spoke on the telephone Thursday, the French president, with his U.S. counterpart, partly to clear up some of the remarks he made when he was over in China. Uh, is he still seen as the, the, uh, 
the darling of uh, the reformists, like when he was applauded by a joint session of Congress? Look, it varies by uh, the country. In the U.S., I think a lot of uh, the younger people kind of see through the, the calm, collected, uh, put-together act um, that he has been putting on for a while. Um, there's, yeah, sometimes there's people mocking him for just the way that he presents himself and just how, you know, uh, uh, polished uh, it comes across. Um, and maybe comes even across calculated. as polished. And I do think that the... <laughs> polished and calculated. And I think that... Um, <coughs> Yeah, the, the demonstrations, the way that he's handled this stuff. I mean, I agree. I think his response um, to the pots and pans demonstrations were probably just didn't do him any favors because it, it feeds into the very criticism, uh, criticisms that um, a lot of French people uh, have for him. Um, and I think that that is inevitably going to spread. Um, I do think it's damaged his reputation, maybe yeah. not at the level where, you know, it would lead to anything, but uh, definitely enough for uh, younger people here in the U.S. to, to, to make fun of uh, the way that he presents himself. So, uh, Philippe Montchevrolet, uh, yeah. France's president, who's a pillar, as Richard was saying, at the heart of the European Union, France is a country <coughs> the, the, that matters a lot. Yeah. How isolated is he really? I mean, you, in France or outside of well, France? Just inside of France. Can you rule the country inside by of yourself? France Can is, you rule the country by yourself? Apparently, that's the that's the most problematic question that we face. Apparently, he can. That's a problem we have. That's and how why, do the French feel about that? Bad. That's why our intellectuals are all saying that there is a huge problem. He doesn't seem to understand that we we have difficulties communicating with him. But our main problem is not Macron per se. I mean, it's a little bit ridiculous when he wants, he, he, he overdoes, he over, we, we say in France that he's, he's, he's surjou, he's over, overplaying. overplaying all the time. So he's all, always a little bit, you know, you can make fun at him, it's easy. And, but the, the problem we have now is really different, is that we, again, we are facing someone who wants to run the country absolutely alone, without any prime minister to speak of, really. And this is the original sin, the fact that he didn't come from the world of politics. He never run for office till he, he ran no... for president in 2017. He doesn't know how to do retail politics, sell. He's not, uh, I don't know how to express that, really. He doesn't know how to make uh, his own authority acceptable to the people. On the night of the second round of the legislative elections, he promised, he said, look, I acknowledge, True. I did not win an outright majority in parliament. No. I will do deals. But I will it, do politics. And, I will reach and, out. And that was exactly one year ago. He was re-elected on April 24, 2022. So it proves that uh, this reality, the reality that he promised to take into account has disappeared. Why? Because he still think that he can make the difference. He can make the personal difference. He believes he's lucky, I would say. He believes he has the lucky card in his hand. He doesn't. Yes, he does I have the lucky card. He's never lost. That's true. So you say it. And that's what he think. So he's still playing the game. He's still playing poker. The difficulty he has when it comes to Europe, I would not talk here about France domestically. Uh, in Europe, you can only succeed if you build coalition of countries in the Europe, U European Union. You cannot succeed alone. You have to get allies behind you. And for him, the big problem at the moment is a lot of countries are reluctant to go behind him because they see him as a fragile leader, a leader who has a lot of good ideas potentially, but may not be able to carry them through. He's, he's got the Superman complex. He thinks that he's a hero that can solve everything. <laughs> when, he goes to, when he talks with Putin on the phone, he, I think part of him sincerely believes that he can change the course of history by talking with that guy. When he goes to China, I'm sure that partly... He thinks that he can change the course of history, the, the course of history by, uh, you know, being the mediator between Russia, China, and Ukraine. That's not possible, and that's doing a lot of damage to our, our image outside of France. And uh, the problem we have is that there is no checks and there are no checks and balances anymore. So this person that we don't really know anymore has the ability to do basically what he wants.
That's what we realized during that crisis. That's the main issue we have. Next week, uh, we'll see what happens when, uh, as in the build-up to uh, that, uh, May the, those May the 1st demonstrations and beyond. I want to thank you, um, Philippe Morochevrolet. I want to thank as well uh, Richard Verli. We also want to thank uh, Patrick Smith for being with us from London, Noor Ibrahim in New York City. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week. <laughs>